Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very happy to bring the conversation I had with Renee DeResta. Renee is the former technical research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory, where she was looking at and studying uh, abuse and in information technologies. Uh, her work examines a variety of things, uh, propaganda, uh, misinformation in the digital age, geopolitical campaigns uh, created by foreign powers such as Russia, China, and Iran, conspiracy theories, uh, domestic influencers, health misinformation, uh, many, many, many topics. She is a contributor at The Atlantic. Her writing has appeared everywhere in Wired, Foreign Affairs, New York Times, Washington Post, as well as many academic journals. And she is the author of the latest book, Invisible Rulers, the people who turn lies into reality. And that's what we talk about in the conversation. We start by talking about what is misinformation and disinformation, uh, rise of influencers and some of the incentive structures there. Talk about audience capture, what that is, why it's why it works, why it's so effective in, in some pretty negative ways. You know, what are the ethical responsibilities online? The Twitter files election interference, and many, many other topics. Obviously, this is an important uh, topic. People kind of throw around the words misinformation and disinformation all the time. Obviously, those are real things, but uh, she has a kind of surgical way of trying to understand what these things really are, uh, what, what we're doing as we're you know, in the digital space, whether it's social media, whether it's just the internet or online. Um, there's really, really... Uh, big problems with um, foreign interference, domestic interference, the bots, um, you know, all the algorithms. And so it's a, in some ways a, a wild west out there. And so Renee is doing the hard work um, of trying to figure out what's going on and how to um, make things a, a better and healthier place online. And so it's, it's a very, very important. I've really liked her work for a long time. I've wanted to talk to her uh, about her research, I've wanted to talk about this topic uh, for 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 a bit, and so this was uh, a really really nice conversation to talk about such an important uh, issue like this. As always, you can find this conversation and all the conversations at Converging Dialogues. That's Substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so follow, subscribe, like, share with your friends. Feel free to reach out if you enjoy these conversations. And uh, now I bring you Renee the rest of I am here with Renee DeResta. Uh, Renee, thanks so much for, for coming on. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. No, no, yeah, the pleasure's all mine. You have done some incredible work. I've followed your work for a little bit, so I'm excited to, to talk about it. You have a, a more recent book that's been out uh, called Invisible Rulers, The People Who Turn Lies Into Reality. And it is uh, quite, quite uh, essential reading for, for our time at the moment. So there's so many things that, that have been going on in the world. Uh, I guess before we get into much of the major themes and topics of the book, uh, why don't you tell listeners uh, who you are um, professionally, academically, what you're currently up to and what you spend your time, most of your time doing nowadays? Yeah, so I'm Renee DeRosta. I, until recently, was the technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, I left that role in June. Mm. I've been doing a lot of work lately on, you know, future of the internet <laughs> kind of stuff. So I write a little bit about it in the closing chapter of the book, right? Mm. The question of, um, so much of how we experience the world, the online world is a function of like platform design. So a lot of the work that I'm doing right now actually looks at what makes social media better from a design perspective. How do you give mm. more power to the user? What happens when you give more power to the user? You know, it's not, not exactly an unalloyed good, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we think about these trade-offs and the ways that social media is going to change? That's what I've been focusing on mm -hmm. um, for the last six months or so. Historically, you've done a lot of, a lot of work with uh, other types of things, some of, some of which I'm sure we'll get into in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the internet with misinformation. You've talked about uh, kind of Russian influence online. You've, you've done a lot of different things. Like, kind of more historically, what, what else have you done? Oh yeah, so I, I still do that as well. <laughs> I see these things as related. Sure, Sorry, sure, in my sure. head, in my head, that made sense. <laughs> um, the uh, 
So yeah, so for about um, 10 years now, I've looked at how narratives move across the kind of the online environment, um, how influencers, um, you know, make certain stories gain popularity, how crowds of people online are incredible, um, you know, tools for distribution, how networked activism works, uh, and then how algorithms feed into that system, right? Influencers, algorithms, and crowds all together. And then, um, you know, I was talking about design and how design changes the system. Well, one thing that happens is that when you have a tool like the internet, which is incredible for spreading stories and therefore um, really shifting political power in a lot of cases, you see state actors and other people, kind of terrorist organizations and things, come into the mix as well. Mm. So a lot of the work that I've done over the years has looked at ways that um, that state actors use the same technology as activists to get their own uh, points of view across, to get their own you know, the policies and um, positions that they want to see in the world, how they use it to shape reality as well. And so in that vein, I actually did just have a piece up on the Iran hack and leak operations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You possibly remember the... Um, the Trump campaign was hacked yep. about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I've been doing a bunch of work on, uh, on that as well. Still, that's more of like, it pops up as, um, you know, as, uh, indicators that some manipulation has happened, mm -hmm. take shape. And then I, uh, get involved in going and looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're doing important work. I guess the, the, the really important thing to kind of get out of the way here in the beginning is, there's all these terms that get thrown around and get used. So misinformation, disinformation, propaganda. I guess for you, what's your sort of operational sort of definition or or what, what works for you and how you kind of dissect between the differences between these things, how there many things can be labeled one of these things inaccurately or or maybe not uh, you know, there's it's not as precise. How do we navigate that kind of world of what we're calling things and how to how to label it of sorts? Yeah, so typically uh, misinformation has been used to refer to information that is like inadvertently wrong, right? The person who's sharing it just doesn't know mm. they're, you know, they're mistaken. And um, disinformation is differentiated by intent. So mm. the argument is that um, somebody with an intent to influence, an intent to deceive, uses the communication technology to sort of um, manipulate an audience. Mm. And that could be you know, in the age of the internet, that could be using fake accounts, that could be using automated accounts, a lot of different ways that you can manipulate a conversation to make it look like you have a majority opinion or, mm. or to put, you know, false or misleading claims out there into the world. I think ultimately I use disinformation most often when it's a very deliberate, coordinated, systemic thing, as opposed to something that just kind of happens on the internet. You know, I, I think propaganda and rumors are way better terms than misinformation for categorizing the kinds of things that people actually care about, that they're actually talking about when they use that word. So, you know, it's um, different people have different opinions on that, but that's mine. Mm, yeah, this is very, very interesting. I guess you, you, there's this like interesting thing now, this world that we live in where things are very fast and people are getting information very fast, but there's this uh, you, you mentioned in the beginning this sort of obsessive quality or nature with being an influencer. And, you know, before you would have these kind of, you know, Hollywood or, you know, Hollywood light kinds of people, but now everyone has a phone or everyone has access to an account or they're on a stream or they're on all these different platforms. And there's a, there's a whole kind of industry about how people do this, how you go viral, how you, you know, get clicks, what's the algorithm saying or not saying, or various algorithms, I should say. So tell us about this kind of influencer culture as well. There's all these things that go on online. You have types of misinformation, disinformation, but you also have this, you know, the rise of influencer culture. H how does this in your mind work and what keeps it kind of, you know, feeding the beast of sorts? Yeah, so the influencer phenomenon is really interesting. Um, there's never been a, a different, you know, in other media environments, you don't have this self-created, um, you know, this figure that just decides, hey, I'm going to go start saying things on the internet, which everybody does, right? But I'm going to make it almost a career. I'm going to work to really establish myself to be known in this particular field as a commentator, um, not as media, right? So they're speaking as themselves. They don't necessarily see themselves as media. They're not branding themselves as a news organization. They're not pretending to be journalists. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're a, a different thing entirely. 
They're also not exactly celebrities. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, celebrity comes with, um, you know, you become known for producing art, perhaps being a sports figure, being very, very good at something. And then media covers you. And that is one of the ways in which you become a celebrity. So somebody on the outside decides that you're interesting and then media attention goes to that person. They might not even want it, right? You see a lot of celebrities who don't necessarily want to be mm -hmm. followed around by a paparazzi and things, whereas the influencer is out there doing it themselves, right? They're out there with the, <laughs> with the selfie stick, mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. putting themselves out there themselves. Um, and they can become celebrities. You know, you see like Charlie D'Amelio, this famous mm -hmm. dancer on TikTok, who then winds up on Dancing with the Stars, you know? And, and so there is this path, um, which is one reason why some influencers do it. It is to become famous. It is to have that, um, that sort of, um, you know, being known to the public and being able to capitalize on it. But influencers on social media are really turning themselves into sometimes voices for their community, sometimes um, representatives of a, an identity. You know, I am a mom in San Francisco. I am a, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I raise chickens on a farm in Wyoming, you know, these sorts of things. So they're putting their life out there. And their followers, oftentimes their early followers, are people who are just like them, right? And so they're doing this, um, you know, this sort of performance almost, this, this way of sort of sharing with the world what it's like to live in a particular way. And that is very appealing to people. And so they, they sort of become, you know, they're very, very tightly tied to this crowd of followers who also helps them make money. So the influencer crowd relationship is, um, is really strong. And then the last thing I'll say is that the influencer also really understands the algorithm. So there's, you know, algorithms reward certain types of content and the influencer is constantly testing to see if the content they're producing is rewarded by the algorithm. You know, they're watching their YouTube, you know, they're looking at their YouTube video analytics or their TikTok analytics to say, hey, when did people drop off? Are there topics that get me more attention? You know, so they're tailoring their content, not only for the human audience, but for the algorithmic audience as well for the algorithm. What, what is the, I guess the, I guess there might be multiple ones, but what's the incentive structure or incentive structures for, for many? So you're describing a kind of general story that happens for a lot of people, right? Which is I, I'm into, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. And, oh, here's other people that are also kind of into this. And so people gravitate towards that. You build a following, you build an audience, you build a whatever. Okay, cool. And then, yes, you, you start to see the algorithm, but there's, there's things that are incentivized. Obviously, social status sometimes, if you get really big, money, of course, financial uh, um, incentives. Um, but, but there are a variety of incentives, right? And so there are, maybe tell us about the incentive structure, and then I'll ask you about kind of the different types of people you discuss online as well, because that's also very interesting. Yeah, so the incentive structure is really um, how are you you know, if you're an influencer, um, you need to continue to grow your follower count and you need to continue to monetize your following, mm -hmm. right? And there's a couple of ways that you do that. Um, one is through sponsorships. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at, you know, content on Instagram, um, you know, you have, let's, let's stick with our San Francisco mom influencer, right? Um, <laughs> I was a San Francisco mom, <laughs> not an influencer, <laughs> but, um, let's say, you know, the mom, um, posting pictures of their kids all the time, they're messy. All of a sudden, you know, some detergent company reaches out. Literally, this this happens actually fair fair amount. Does it really? So the detergent, yeah, the detergent company. So I have a couple. Tides of reaching people. out to somebody <laughs> on TikTok, so you're like, yeah, you're, absolutely, a hundred percent, yes, yes. And so then there's a you know sponsored content is what it's called, yeah. where depending on how big your following is, you might get a couple thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, five hundred dollars. If you're huge, thirty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, right? So the size of your audience really shapes the kinds of sponsorships that you can get. So you're incentivized to grow that following so that you get better sponsorships. Also, on some platforms like YouTube, it's your view counts that matter, right? It's how many people are watching your videos because they have to be there to sort of see the ad, you know, the ads that are on top of them. So you hit this point at which you can monetize. Facebook has this too, the sort of creator, you know, after you have over a thousand followers on your page or so. Uh, in some countries, you can monetize through this creator relationship. Um, and then what winds up happening is you are able to, um, you know, as you continue to grow your following, 
you're getting monetization according to the number of people who have viewed the content or the video. So again, mm-hmm. you're trying to be appealing um, to an audience to, to, to get these views. So how do you do that? Well, it turns out there's a lot of things that any given person can watch on the internet at any moment in time. And so they have yeah. to watch your content in right. order for you to get those views. Uh, and so this is where you do start to see the incentive structure being like, how do you capture attention? Mm-hmm. And if you've been on YouTube, you've definitely seen these, you know, these sort of clickbaity thumbnails where it's, yeah. you know, um, the thing that I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I know people right. that do like, these videos and they do yeah. it intentionally. The thumbnail is a certain <laughs> way. 100%, and then yes, there's a certain absolutely. caption and it's like, oh my gosh. And it's like. Big, bold text <laughs> in the caption. And that's because, again, they're not only making the video for the human viewer, right? The human mm. viewer has to be interested enough to stay, right? To, to sort of like to follow that video through for, you know, for enough time in order to, for the monetization to hit. Um, but they also have to make it interesting to the algorithm because the algorithm there, that's, that's where the business incentive of the platform comes into play. So the platform doesn't want to push boring videos at people or, or like ugly, you know, images. So the creator is creating content for the algorithm also. And that's something that's really, really interesting. It's sort of, it's new in this information environment because in the age of like broadcast, like television, Right, everybody is roughly watching the same thing. You want to be sort of mass market, you know, mass market appeal. In the age of the internet, you're looking to appeal to a particular niche that's going to follow your content and pay attention. So you're trying to find the people who are most interested in your stuff, and you're producing content that the algorithm is going to reward. So you know, we have this notion now. Like, think about. Um, I feel like you're probably around the same age as me, right? You used to <laughs> take a picture of like you know, whatever is out there in the world. And, you, you know, and now you think about it as like, how is this framed for Instagram? You know, what is the mm-hmm. square version going to look like? What is the vertical video going to look like? What's in my background? Like even, even, you know, like even when I take pictures of my kids, right, you know, that you're going to, you know, and my Instagram is private, but you know that you're going to share them in a certain way. And the algorithm is going to choose from among all of the different Mm -hmm. images that it has available to show to your friends and family. And if you want yours to get picked, right, you're, you're sort of like your caption and your, your composition and all of it um, shapes whether something gets shown to people. And that's actually sort of a, it's very weird (laughs) if you think Mm -hmm. about it, way in which we make content for machines now, not just, Mm -hmm. uh, not just humans. Well, certainly. I mean, as I'm very close to 40, I'm in, I'm in my late 30s. I can remember a time before Instagram, and right. <laughs> I can remember a time before Facebook and before social media and before the internet. Right? I'm I'm a, I'm a good old millennial at this point, but it's one of those things where yeah, it is it is strange where um, you sort of will curate how you're doing things based on where you're going to put it. Before yeah. you would you know just. Just did you it. take a, a, a Kodak <laughs> camera or disposable one, right? Yep, and yep. you would take it and it's in a box somewhere after you developed it or whatever, right? Like now yeah. it's it's not that way anymore. Now it's, and you know, okay, there's, there's a difference there, but then it, it does, I think, kind of inform, I mean, maybe in some ways people might take better pictures, but in some ways it does say like, yeah, people are, are very kind of keyed into how it's going to be uh, viewed. What There's more of an audience. It's not just... It's not just grandma when she comes over and looks in your 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 box with pictures. It's like, oh, okay, well, now I got like however many followers, and oh, everyone's gonna see it, and like you know, you know, it's all those things. So, it's interesting about the the audience and people who view it in the book, and this will become more relevant uh, a little bit uh, later when we talk about another issue. But there are so many things. Uh, online and there's so many groups and there's so many different types of folks so you talk about entertainers you talk about explainers besties idols gurus contrarians propagandists and let's be honest we know all of these people we oh, know yeah. we know all of these <laughs> folks um some personally some not and <clears throat> okay i guess the question i have is is this How how I have two parts to this, but how big is audience capture really? Like, is it is it is it a real thing? Because you know, I don't I don't do that thing where I name names. I, I don't think that that's you know that's kind of that's that's tacky of sorts. But yeah, I can think of a bunch of people that you know had a a small following of people just having fun, 
and they got hooked on like one issue at the right time, and they are still talking about that issue four or five years later. Um, it's an anti thing. It's a you know a pro thing or whatever, and these people have now hundreds of thousands of followers or more. And their Patreon is just dinging every second with all of the, you know, because it's just people get this like thing they want to keep hearing. You know, I'm, I, I've done 76, you know, podcasts in a row on why COVID is a deep conspiracy and, you know, vaccines are terrible for you. And people just will listen to all 76 in a row of those episodes. And it's just, it's it's a real thing, right? Audience capture is a legit real thing because I can see smart, intelligent people have their mind just completely fucking warped with <laughs> with this. And I know these are smart people, but I do think there's a probably a variety of things, some psychological, other things, you know, they have a bad experience or a few experiences. But I have to imagine it's like a it's like a it's a reciprocal thing. It's like, well, I keep getting this, I'm getting more money. I'm also getting shared. I'm also getting legitimately liked. People are sending me nice messages. I'm doing something good by sharing what other people aren't going to share in legacy media, blah, blah, blah. All these things. It's like th- there has to be this kind of relationship, no? Or, or is that overstated, the audience capture thing? No, it's real. I mean, it, I don't know that anybody's ever looked at like prevalence, like how many. Um, you see it a lot in the political influencer sphere, though, right? People are rewarded for being the most extreme expression yeah. of the, um, of the, uh, of the, like, whatever the niche identity is. And, um, and this is not only a, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not owned by any particular political party either. You see it on the left, you see it on the right, far sure, left, far sure. right, you know, it's, because again, they, in order to be the face of the movement or the, the, the voice that the audience comes to, they are rewarded by being the sort of most extreme, most strident, most, you know, I will say the thing that no one else will say kind of voice. And then they're getting their feedback from their audience. And again, as, as we described, like, you know, a couple of minutes ago, that audience is what's going to help them monetize. Like that audience, you know, we're talking about social media, but it's true on Substack also, like, or mm-hmm. Patreon, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. subscription models. Um, those people pay you. And one thing I've noticed, and we, <laughs> again, we can not name names. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a sort of COVID contrarian that I follow every now and then, um, just to, you know, take the pulse of where, where things are in COVID contrarian land. Mm. And as COVID has ceased to be a thing that is like, you know, the central thing in everybody's mind, uh, you know, as, as people sort of move back into, into, you know, normal life and things, um, what you see there is that the Patreon subs, you can actually go and look this up, mm. right? The Patreon subs are declining. Mm. So, yeah, you know, he's off by maybe 40% or so from his sort of peak in 2021. That translates to real money, right? Sure. And so when you when you sort of follow this um this shift, you're seeing this, you know, <laughs> this particular individual has moved into like all sorts of other wild conspiracy theories mm-hmm. that attract a lot of attention. And so you when the one thing that got you that attention begins to fade away, they don't just say like, oh, okay, well, you know, I guess my moment, you know, my 15 minutes are up. No, 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 no. We have to pivot to this other thing, this other adjacent thing mm-hmm. that we can all now be very, very mad about. And so you see people sort of move their audience into different spheres. Some part of their audience drops off. Again, this is just using a sample size of one, but you can go mm-hmm. and you can mm-hmm. pull the Patreon stats on this and somebody somewhere will do the study one day <laughs> and you'll see that, you know, you'll see that shift. You'll see that, that topicality will change. They'll talk about something new. And that's in part to kind of like, make sure that you're, that you're keeping that, um, that income stream in. So you, you cannot separate it from the economics. So I totally agree with you. I guess the question I have here is more of a, a moral or philosophical one is, I guess for me, Responsibility lies on both parties. And for you, where do you see responsibility lying, right? Because both parties meaning the audience too? Correct. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I think it relies. <laughs> I think the audience is, is in it also. Yeah. <laughs> because it's my <laughs> choice to click on it, to listen yes, to it, to follow this. Because I can see this stuff and I'll look at it, I'll roll my eyes and I keep going. And I right. do that with a lot of things nowadays, mostly because I'm a little bit more cynical, but it is one of those things where it's like, I'm not giving this viewership. I'm not going, I know what this is mostly going to say. And I want, if it's in good faith, okay, I'll, I'll listen to it. I don't mind listening to any idea, but 
if I've heard this person talk about it or they're just shifting from conspiracy to conspiracy to conspiracy now, or now it's so far down that we're doing Alex Jones interviews, it's like, well, I don't need, what do I need to know about this, right? Like, why do I, but I just feel like, mm, again, I'm not trying to pitch myself as the most responsible viewer, but you know, I do try to be careful and think about people that are putting good things out there and they're trying to do something. And I guess, yeah, I just always have this question, I guess, morally or ethically of, you know, is it, is it the responsibility of, you know, of Rogan to, to say all these things in 2020 during a pandemic? I have nothing against Rogan necessarily, right? But it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you have like 50 million, 15 million people that listen to that. And just asking questions isn't always the right timing to do that. But also, doesn't it behoove the person that's listening to it to say, you know what, I'm going to hold off on this and maybe, but. <laughs> maybe I'm just maybe I'm a little bit too like uh, idealistic here, but where do you see that uh, responsibility lie? Yeah, it's a great question. So I do think that the responsibility lies primarily with the influencer in that regard, because mm-hmm. again, as you know, um, you know, you, I, I think the same way we would have been horrified if, or people are horrified, frankly, when media gets something wrong, right? I mean, how many people mm-hmm. when media mm-hmm. gets something wrong, there's like a whole outcry yeah. about how the media got it wrong, oh, yeah. right? And and this is a um, and that's because people feel like they've been betrayed by this thing that is supposed to be trustworthy and accurate. Now, influencers actually almost never face that reckoning. You know, their critics will complain, and you know you'll see it. Um, Rogan's an interesting case because his subreddit actually has largely kind of turned against him, which is a very interesting, interesting. dynamic. If you go into, um, you know, I, I sort of read the. Um, I read a lot of the Reddits for the, the sort of big influencer uh, podcasts and things like this. Mostly because, again, <laughs> like um, Reddit pushes them to me at this point. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Your, your knows, algorithms you know? on your on, it must be <laughs> I mean, so is, fascinating. Mine, mine are wild. They're absolutely <laughs> wild. Um, but um, but I do find it I do find it interesting. And and um, and you know, and I again I, I I am not like a recurring podcast listener, um, but I uh, I do read the I do read the subreddits a lot. Um, What's been interesting about it is his fandom, a lot of them in that subreddit feel like he's sort of moved away from bringing on interesting guests and having mm-hmm. a conversation to bringing on guests who support a particular preconceived set of ideas or a political agenda. And so you see that um, that sort of distaste, the sort of almost longing for what it was mm-hmm. pre-COVID and a feeling that it's shifted somehow. Um, you can see this in a, there are a few different subreddits where it's sort of interesting. You think you're going into a fandom, but it actually it's really sort of morphed to being mm. a whole collection of critics of people who were fans and actually now feel like they've been sort of um, like their interest, their their sort of like entertainment or content needs are no longer really being met by this person. I think as far as the question of like should people click away or not share, yes. And you know, I spend time in the book on this. Right, you uh, <laughs> there was a. Um, there's this like Marcus Aurelius quote mm. that I liked, whereas like, you know, things before you have, like things have no power over you in and of themselves. You choose yeah. how you react to that thing. And I think as, as people think about, am I sharing this because I'm outraged? Am I sharing this because I'm scandalized? Is this like a, you know, look at this idiot share, like a hate share. Mm-hmm. Um, you do have, individuals do have a lot of power um, because the idea that something just magically goes viral on its own or just because an algorithm, you know, does it. It's not actually true. Things go viral because the audience engages with them. And that is what the algorithm keys off of. It keys off of the likes and shares of a whole lot of people acting right around the same time. So it is, you know, you do have, even as just sort of a consumer of content on the internet who maybe is not a creator or not trying to be an influencer, you do have some power um, in in your sort of role as as part of that Mm that collective, because we're all out there, um, you know, shaping public opinion through what we share, what you share, your Facebook followers see your, you know, your Twitter followers see your threads, blue sky, whatever platform you're on now, like they do see it. And so there is a, um, you know, teaching people to think before they share. I know, you know, it's in my, like my fifth graders media literacy sort of (laughs) curriculum and he's not even on social media, you know? (laughs) So they're just this whole, like, Things on YouTube might not be real, you know. They start to tell them that in around second grade now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so, well, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, it's and that only it will increase as we have, you know, deep fakes and you know, good AI and you know, all these things that will that will almost certainly increase. It it is a, it is a strange thing about 
um, how we how we are able to, to to navigate this and where there is a responsibility a bit of the the viewer. I mean, look, I mean, I've shared things too. I'll you know I'll share it with a friend or something like that. But you know, I, over time, I, I just I think the thing that frustrates me the most is something will happen a moment and then you're getting think pieces and op-eds and mammalian sub stacks and some podcasts and a panel. And it's like, oh, man, this was like, this was just somebody walking a dog in the park and it doesn't, oh, it yeah. doesn't need to turn into, you know, this whole big thing. I mean, people make it that way. Um, and some yeah. things I will be fair. I think some things probably do have some kind of value to them of saying like, okay, this was, this was a legitimate moment. In history, you know, we should probably, you know, take this, you know, or whatever. Like, I, I'm, I'm with that, but I think a lot of things aren't. And it is interesting how many people uh, that maybe normally wouldn't have, you know, a, a sort of kind of accessibility to say these things now do. And that's where you do get a lot of, there's a lot of woo out there. There's a lot of woo. There's <laughs> a lot of woo out there on Instagram, on YouTube, on, on all the platforms. Um, and it is... It is tough because it's it is it does become kind of like an information avalanche, and people are scratching their heads, being like, "Well, this person has a degree. Well, this person has done some research, or whoa, they did teach here, or oh, they did, you know." And it's hard to know how do I how do I kind of trust certain things? How do I know which information is there? Not everyone can be a, a fact checker, and not everyone's going to do their own research, right. and that makes it hard. That may, and that's why I feel like this stuff does have a lot of you know moral kinds of loading to it where it's like no there's some serious consequences to to some of these things so i would agree i would put more of the responsibility on the the person the influencer or, who, or the creator or whatever but i do think there's power as you're saying with the audience too one thing that's really interesting that i do think um in you know people who follow influencers the thing to watch for a lot of the time is like the big if true language right that that's the sort of thing where I wish we had a like that's the kind of media literacy we need. If somebody's saying big if true or someone should look into this right. while sharing it, right. usually what they're trying to do there is get the attention, get the rage, get those mm. like those clicks um, by sharing something that you know they themselves have doubts about, right? And they just think, oh, I'm just asking questions. Oh, I'm just mm -hmm. tossing this out. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I do think teaching people to recognize that actually like shaping norms around that as being something that's like really sort of like antisocial and bad, actually. Mm. Um, you don't necessarily need to make every moment go viral all the time. And I tell the story in the book of this one incident that I remembered because um, I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I woke up and, you know, the East Coast had been awake for three hours and there had been this protest in DC. And, um, you know, there was this kid in a MAGA hat uh, we oh, went to yes. the school called yes. Covington yes, Catholic, yes, yes, yeah, yes. in Kentucky. I don't know if you remember that when it actually happened, but I do because I woke I up and I was like, "All of it. Everybody is mad. Who's everybody? Who's everybody mad at?" You know, <laughs> I DM'd a friend, and I was like, um, "What happened? Like, what? Who is this kid? Why is this all over? Why is this all over my feed? You know, catch me up, East Coaster. You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and you know, and it was like you had people like very, very, very prominent media figures. You know, the kid has a punchable face. The story, for those who are not familiar, just to kind of sketch it out, is that um, there had been a protest. I think uh, there was like a pro-life march, or like uh, that. Uh, yeah, and that was where the the sort of these kids from this Catholic school in Kentucky were there. Um, and then there was also a Native American related mm -hmm. event that was happening, sort of also on the other side of the mall, maybe. So you had these two groups, and there was this image that went viral of this boy in a MAGA hat kind of smirking at this Native American elder who was, like, beating a drum. And it became this, this like, almost Rashomon moment, or Rashomon's this movie where you see the same story told through different mm -hmm. points of view, different perspectives. And, and you, see this, um, you see this image, and depending on kind of what side you're on politically, this image really takes a form of, like, you either immediately like hate the MAGA kid, right? And you look at this, look, you know, look at this jerk kid, right? Um, smirking at this, this old man. Um, and then it, it sort of comes out later as full video of the incident emerges that actually there was sort of a third group there. These, this mm -hmm. group called the Black Hebrew Israelites, who if you've ever encountered them, it's like groups of, um, you know, there's sort of these, I guess religious might be the way to put it, that's sort of like culty fundamentalists who 
make this argument about being the sort of lost tribe of Israel and, you know, who are the chosen people. And yep. they're very aggressive. They sort of like mm-hmm. <laughs> yell obscenities mm-hmm. at people. Mm-hmm. And so they had been in this mix also, but they're not in the photographs that go viral. And so the story of like how this encounter happens um, doesn't come out for several hours after this, this sort of viral moment where everybody's forming opinions. And it's a really interesting dynamic because part of it, part of the interesting aspect is that, right, is that everybody's forming an opinion without the full story. But the other piece of it really is, I was like, why are we all mad about this? You know, <laughs> why is everybody mm-hmm. talking about this? Mm-hmm. Um, it's this, because what it is, is like a random two minute interaction between a couple of groups of people at a protest. And like, if you've ever been at a protest, you've seen this happen in real life. And unless somebody is there with a camera recording it, streaming it, and someone then gets upset about it, it's just a moment that happens and passes. Nobody gets hurt, nothing, there's no violence. There's no bigger perspective to take from this as an event in and of itself. So it's the sort of pseudo event that just goes viral because it sort of touches the right notes in the culture war for a whole bunch of different groups. And it's, it's really sort of an example, I think, of, uh, of what is kind of bad about social media, which is this is, not a, this is not an event that we all should have been paying attention to at all. This is not evidence of some sort of bad thing that has happened. Instead, it's just uh, an interaction between a few people, you know, the same way these videos about people fighting over parking spaces mm-hmm. <laughs> become mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. touch points in the culture wars. And everybody's yelled at somebody about a parking space at some point in their life. So that, that picture became like a projective uh, a test. It was just, you know, you had to look at it and somebody would have one perspective, or whatever. Uh, yes. About the protest thing. Yeah. I've lived around DC for most of my life and I, I've worked there for many, many years. And yeah, anyone that works or lives or has been around DC, there's always something going on in Capitol Hill. There's always a million protests. Like there's always going to be a kind of like mixing. And it just was like, I don't know. I didn't have any of those responses when I saw that. And I was, I forgot about it after like a day. And then like people talked about that. I mean, that thing had legs. Oh, yeah. Well, because he sued. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just, the, the kid in the picture sued for, I think, defamation. <laughs> libel or defa- defamation. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So there, and I think he got settlements from a few. Yeah, a few it outlets. was um, crazy. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was, yeah. I don't understand it. So, uh, two last things, real quick. Um, yep. I want you to tell us. I mean, I know you told this story before, you can tell in the book, but uh, I just give kind of my piece of it here for, for to set you up for it. But so, you had some, uh, you had two characters that were bullying you in our <laughs> U.S. Congress with Jim Jordan. Listen, <clears throat> you can set it up for us. Of course, it's your story, but I'm just, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you personally, I was never, I, f- I felt it was somewhat okay, but I just, when I saw the characters involved and everyone doing it, I never was really on board with this Twitter files thing. It felt so online. It felt so like ridiculous to me. It's and people were treating it like it was like, you know, uh, uh, top secret documents had just been unlocked from fifty years ago. Like if people were, I mean, it was so ridiculous. But there are these two guys. Uh, I mean, I loosely know them. I know people that know them of sorts is Matt Taibbi and and Shallen, Michael Schellenberger. And I'll just say about. I think both of them in particular, especially Schellenberger, you know, he kind of came out, I think he was like a pretty, pretty staunch liberal. And then he kind of red pilled or whatever. And he writes this book kind of sort of asking questions about climate change and how we talk about it. Uh, Apocalypse now. So no, um, what's it called? Uh, Apocalypse never, never or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I've read that book and, you know, it's fine or whatever, I guess. But then it just kind of what we were saying earlier, it, he just shifted to other things. It, it was that and then it was, you know, on to other other types of things, you know, with election, with you know, culture issues, things like that. And Taibi, I think, is a journalist, right? A writer, a journalist. And um, he also has had a various evolution. But these two folks kind of get involved to, 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 to kind of investigate. Uh, and there are other characters as well. And it turns out to just be pretty vicious and nasty especially with you getting in the mix so yeah maybe you set us up here uh, uh about this and then 
why why were they bullying you? Why why were they why were they bothering you? I don't you're not some, you know, you know, government overseer that wants to monitor everybody. And I just it just the way they painted it was again another thing of like people get sucked into this thing from one issue and there's they're just in that black hole and their minds get warped and it's like these are smart, intelligent, good people I think initially and they allow these things and now you're just Normal things you're seeing, you know, there's when when <laughs> when you have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And that's really what it feels like. So yeah, tell well, us about I think, this. I think that's actually a big part of it, right? So, you know, imagine you have a sub stack. Again, we're talking about subs, right? You you want to, um, you know, Elon Musk offers you it, you know, access to the internal emails of Twitter, right? And keep in mind that for a very long time, conservatives had felt that Twitter was somehow silencing them, right. that it was disproportionately targeting them overwhelmingly right-wing content performs better on social media across all platforms. This is something that has been true for a very, very, very long time now. And it's reinforced over and over and over again, study after study. It just does better. I have theories about why that is. I think maybe we're starting to see some shifts on the left that are going to kind of, um, you know, make that less imbalanced. Mm. But for, for a long time, right-wing content has performed a lot better. It's just edgier. It sort of speaks to the tone of social media. Anyway, despite this, you also then have enforcement actions that platforms like Twitter have taken. Um, it took down 70,000 QAnon accounts after January 6th. So again, as that community kind of continued to have violent rhetoric around, you know, around January 6th and after, uh, Twitter decided to take down 70,000 accounts. These accounts then sort of went over to Telegram, and that was the, that was the progression that had happened. Um, Donald Trump's account, of course, was also taken down mm -hmm. after January 6th. And that became a subject of massive debate all around the world, academia, world leaders, mm -hmm. you name it. So there were some interesting things in the Twitter files as far as like, how did those moderation decisions get made? And I think there are questions that they ask, you know, that they, but, but of course, Elon picks these, you know, these sort of writers because he knows that he's going to get mm -hmm. what he wants, mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So this is not like you just gave a whole bunch of writers of different ideologies mm -hmm. access. No, no, no. You sort of pick your writers. So in a sense, it's sort of inherently propagandistic right mm -hmm. off the bat. These are the guys that I'm choosing to do this thing. And and they and they do, you know, they sort of find a kind of interesting nugget here, an interesting nugget there. But an interesting nugget here and there doesn't tell the story. It's not as compelling as all of these things are connected in this vast complex of evil people who are conspiring to silence you, right? The facts in the emails, here are some people with incredible responsibilities and incredible power, to be clear, right? Social media you know, teams have incredible power. Um, rather than focusing on the, the nuances or anything there, instead they begin to just sort of tell these reinforcing stories. And what happens also is they get a lot of things wrong. Mm. So you have, you know, Schellenberger who knows nothing about content moderation at all mm -hmm. before this. In fact, he reaches out to me mm -hmm. <laughs> in a DM saying, I want to learn more about content moderation. Will you talk to me? Will you sort of be a source? You know, can, can we have an off the record conversation? And I do that for him for three months. I'm off the record talking to him about, about content moderation. And I'm trying to contextualize, you know, here's what this seems to be. Here's what that seems to be. Um, but he's saying things like, oh, the FBI is paying Twitter. You know, they're, they're giving payments to Twitter to censor how they want. No, when the FBI files a records request or asks a platform to take an action in response to an investigation, they're compensated for their time and effort required to complete that action. Mm -hmm. This is something that is very, very, very well known. There's nothing scandalous about it at all. But if you have no familiarity with legal process or with platform moderation, you can write a whole story about how the FBI is paying Twitter to censor. Mm -hmm. And so you start to see things like, start to see things like that. Or they begin to engage, Tybee in particular, at the time, with these sort of right-wing figures who have been writing these crazy blog posts about how a Stanford, you know, <laughs> where I work and colleagues of mine, have been secretly censoring tens of millions of tweets. Mm -hmm. Now, this is complete BS. This is like the rantings of some, some random rent-a-quote guy who just wants to be featured on right-wing podcasts. Mm -hmm. But they, rather than finding any evidence of that in the Twitter files, because it doesn't exist, they simply kind of like munge these two things together as they're trying to tell their comprehensive, you know, conspiratorial theory of the world take. And <clears throat> excuse me, what winds up happening is that they do create this, you know, they create this cinematic universe, right? Oh, it's yeah. like the Marvel 
It's like the Marvel Universe. You have all these villains <laughs> like me, right? They recur. These villains have to recur. Right. I mean, I got put into so many of these stupid stories where I'm like, I don't even know the other people that I'm being accused of like colluding with. Mm -hmm. Collusion was literally like, Renee was on a webinar once with this person who did this thing. And I'm like, I was on a webinar. Right. <laughs> have you never been on a right, webinar? Right. Like, right, exactly. <laughs> I don't get to lot, pick the other guests. Not a lot of collusion going on there. <laughs> but it's just these, like, these vague theories of action, just complete nonsense. And, but they're and, selling and, like. Sorry, sorry. The, 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 I'll jump in here. The argument I heard over and over and over, I think maybe from them and other people, their surrogates was, well, Twitter is a free is is a, is a is a is a is the 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 town square, right? And and when people get these things shut down, you know, this is a you know free speech, you know, censorship and blah blah blah. I I can't tell you how many times I heard people talk about you know the 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 market square and you know exchange of ideas, and I just don't believe that at all. It's a private company that can do whatever the fuck it wants, and like you when you sign up, terms and agreement. That nobody reads like yeah if you say stuff and like i'm not saying that there wasn't you know maybe some egregious overstepping or whatever or there was a bias at twitter before before elon got it but that that's how it was like i i heard this so much during this stuff it was so obnoxious it's it's an inter i mean it's an art it's like it's an act of framing right like mm -hmm. this is the global town square this is an interesting point of view now because that argument in 20 18 to 2021, mm -hmm. I think you could, or 18 to 2020 or so, you know, there used to be sort of like three big platforms. There's like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you know, if you got taken down from those, like, you know, you, that was the, the sort of, um, you had problems, right? You were not going to be able to, to grow a large audience again. Now there's such a proliferation of different platforms, yeah, yeah. all privately owned different platforms, to be clear, right? Telegram owned by one guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you do have this, this dynamic of, of um, the privately owned public square. You know, it's, it's sort of anachronistic. You would think that mm -hmm. liberals concerned about power would be thinking about that, but that's not the direction mm -hmm. uh, that they actually take it in. So I think there's a lot of questions related to how should platforms moderate? I mean, I've been a big advocate of transparency for the last, you know, nine years now. I've been writing about transparency when a government requests to take down, publish the, you know, publish the request, right? Um, these are, there are ways to manage these requests because they do sometimes come from governments. Sometimes they're bad requests. Mm -hmm. You know, India in particular requests, you know, censorship actions from Twitter, including under Musk, and he continues mm -hmm. to do it because there are certain laws that he's obligated to follow. Um, but, you know, <laughs> right now he's picking a fight with Brazil, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> to not follow Brazilian <laughs> right. laws. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we have these. Uh, it's, 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 it's a you know, it's, it's about power. Ultimately, right? it's about yeah. power. And that and that's the um, my frustration with the Twitter files was that it could have been interesting. Right. Instead yeah, of cherry yeah. picking random anecdotes and assigning like villains who have nothing but to do how with does these it, stories. But how does this get all the way to the U.S. Congress with Jim Jordan? Or just briefly, oh, how, how does that... So because, you're the villain yeah, yeah, in this yeah, universe. Yeah, yeah. And, how does, and how, does this, how does this happen? Yes, it happens because, it, because Jim Jordan is incentivized to do investigations into people who... Like, the work that I did studied the 2020 election, yeah. right? And it really... There's a 240 or so page report uh, that details all of the ways that what, the big lie spread, right? The lie that the election was stolen. And it leads up to the actions of January 6th and really diagrams like, you know, with, you know, backed by research into after the fact, millions of tweets kind of diagramming out how it all happened. That's the document that we put out. And it wound up being, you know, interesting to the January 6th committee. It wound up being interesting to, you know, media, this, this, this work was done very, very publicly. It sat on the internet for two years, just to be clear, before they got mad about it. Mm. Um, and the and and it is the political, you know, <laughs> the political actors in Congress who are incentivized to shut down any effort to kind of detect and respond to those kinds of rumors in real time that are leading these investigations. So Jim Jordan spins up a whole committee fabricates a bunch of BS and a bunch of these, you know, these sort of propaganda reports that his congressional committee puts out. It's very McCarthyist, actually. Mm -hmm. And he cherry picks six words from one email, two words from another. And he alleges that there's been this vast, you know, plot to censor conservatives. But what's very interesting is, again, it's all in the frame. If you mm -hmm. actually get in there, I did a podcast with a center right org, the Dynamist, where we actually started to break down some of the allegations. You know, they, they were asking me about specific claims in this report. 
And there's tweets where it's like, well, this tweet got got tagged. And I'm like, okay, well, what happened? What happened next? Mm. You know, well, was it labeled? No. Was it taken down? No. Okay, so so what happened? <laughs> like, well, what what is what are we what are we, <laughs> what are we, what are we complaining about, about here? here? <laughs> yeah. So that that's where you start to get at this question of um, you know, should we not study these things? You know, some people clearly think the answer to that is yes, I disagree. Mm. Should academics not be able to weigh in and say, like, hey, this looks like it violates your policies? I think that question, the work that we did there on looking at if you tag something that seems to violate a platform policy, does the platform act? The answer was 65% of the time, no, it did not, mm. which is really interesting because it gets at questions around like how open to interpretation are these policies? Who is making that determination? There's a lot of interesting things that that could have been examined in the Twitter files, but instead it was much more convenient to create a cinematic universe of like, you know, villains <laughs> and, and pretend that there was some like, you know, some vast of like cabal, global cabal to, you know, to target conservatives. And that's the story they told instead. It's, it's, it's quite uh, depressing really when you think about it, especially how uh, our tax dollars got wasted with that and <laughs> and time and energy yeah. and and honestly maybe there were some good questions there that could have been asked and it really just became uh, kind of a wash. So I know you're you're a very very busy woman, so I won't keep you. I guess the the <laughs> last question I have here is we have an election coming up. Um, obviously, you've written as you mentioned a lot of stuff about the 2016 election, 2020. I guess the first question I have here is. Is there going to be interference again in our election from foreign actors or from uh, domestic actors or both? And how can we really trust, you know, when we're all watching things come in November 5th, you know, how that was, you know, who, who interfered, who didn't, you know, or in the weeks after, I mean, I'm expecting chaos and a mess as it usually is. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what, what can we learn, I guess, from what to look out for the lessons from 16 and 20 so that way we yep. don't see that in, in a couple months here. Yeah, so foreign actors, yes. I mean, we've already seen the hack of the Trump campaign about three weeks ago. Um, that came from Iran this time, but you might all recall that in 2016 it was Russia. Um, I think you have seen differences in how we respond to that now, differences mm. in how um, we, and I meant America in that case, but like media specifically. Um, the way, like in 2016, the sort of leaked documents, you know, I remember Politico literally running a live blog as it went through sort of sentence by sentence, you know, what was in there. Um, whereas this time around, it was much more of a, we're going to tell the story of the hack and the documents that were dangled in front of us, but we're not going to go there and necessarily put it out. There's some interesting ethical questions there related to, is it newsworthy? Mm. Should they have put it out? You know, I think that question of um, what does the public have a right to know? It seems like some of this was like a vetting dossier by um, of J.D. Vance was one of the documents that was dangled. So, so there's that, the kind of hack and leak piece is, is um, an interesting dynamic. The other thing though, you know, will there be domestic um, manipulation efforts? I think unfortunately the answer is yes, right? I think, you know, we had that, that Biden robocall mm -hmm. um, situation happened. I think there's potential for that kind of, you know, AI generated content to be in the mix baked audio to be in the mix. Mm. Um, and, you know, and, and when state actors do it, when it is foreign influence, it oftentimes doesn't get a lot of pickup mm. because as we've been talking about, it's really people who have a large following like influencers who have mm. the ability to get content in front of people. Mm. So you'd have to get the, you know, if a state creates something, you'd have to get it first to the influencer and then get the influencer to share it. So that process of like, you know, who does the picking up and sharing is actually one of the key questions. And that's where content made by domestic activists mm. is much more likely to be resonant, much more likely to, to get, you know, that initial kind of sharing machine going. And, um, you know, and then the question just becomes, um, is it, is it legal? Turns mm. out the Biden robocall, that guy got $6 million fine and uh, I think criminal charges. Mm. Um, but the question of, is it moral? Is this something that, you know, mm -hmm. You know, who, are people going to decide, well, the end justifies the means and do it anyway? Uh, and if so, how do we respond to that? I think, you know, the the area where we're in worse shape is that as a result of a lot of Jim Jordan's investigations, people in academia, civil society, media are no longer communicating with each other about the election as much as they were 
in 2018 and 2020 because mm. they don't want to be mm. subpoenaed mm. <laughs> and have their emails posted and get death threats and get called a cabal. So that's, yeah. that's that in some ways. Nobody likes those things. Uh, it's not, it's yeah, not pleasant, the, the, is it? The, <laughs> right. So that's, so that's where even though Jordan's wasted, you know, how many millions of dollars in tax mm. dollars running frivolous investigations, you know, he, he got what he wanted mm. and that's the, uh, that's the reality of it. Mm. Mm. Renee, your work is, I mean, completely, I mean, super important. I, I, I love all the stuff that you're doing. Your book is fantastic. Um, and uh, keep, keep, uh, keep doing all the good work out there. You're welcome back here anytime. And big, big thanks for, for coming on. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It was great to chat. Absolutely.